glad you're able to come this morning. Last night, uh, Kitty and I decided to go out to eat uh, to Omaha, and while we were driving into Omaha, a terrific downpour hit us, cloudburst, and I could hardly, uh, my windshield wipers could hardly keep up with the rain that was coming down on us, and we weren't sure if we should continue on or not, but uh, we slowed down and uh, finally made it to Omaha. You know, sometimes in life, we can experience a downpour in our lives where there's a cloudburst. It wasn't expected, and there it is. And in that cloudburst, in that downpour, we can become lost and not sure where we're at. We lose perspective. We lose energy. We lose uh, direction. We lose purpose. And life uh, becomes very, very hard for us. And uh, this experience uh, brings, uh, can be internal, can be external because of the circumstance we're facing. It can be something internally where emotions that we've never felt before are casting their shadow over us. We can be uh, full of despair and, and darkness. And it is not a fun place to be. But uh, it is, does happen to believers, and it is part of, uh, for many of us, part of our experience as Christians. Uh, I think of Elijah, uh, who had an experience, a cloudburst, a storm that came through his life. And uh, he, uh, he asked God to take him home. He said, Lord, I've had enough. You take me home that'd be fine with me. And I'm sure some of us have been in the same place uh, as Elijah. Uh, he said this in ver uh, 1 Kings 19, uh, verse uh, 5. He says, I've had enough, Lord. He said, anyone here can say that? I've had enough. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. I, I wanted to be better. I wanted to go further than my fathers, my forefathers. And I have run into a roadblock. I have run into a, a mountain that I can't get around. And Lord, if you want to take me home, I'm ready to go. And so Elijah experienced that. And I could show you person after person in the uh, Bible that experience these cloud bursts, these days of darkness. If you want to call it depression, you can call it depression. And uh, it's an awful, awful place to be. And uh, I don't want to be there. I've been there myself. And it's not a fun place to be. But uh, there is hope. Uh, there is a way out. Uh, and that way out is found in Psalm 42. I think this will help you. And if you're not going through a cloud burst, well, I hate to tell you this, there's probably one that's going to be coming. And uh, that's the weather forecast. Lots of sunny days, but you may have some cloud bursts, some downpour that comes in your life. And if you can't handle that, you're going to have a challenge in your Christian life. Um, it is part of what we do, it's part of who we are as believers. You know, God never promised us health, wealth, and happiness, you know, forever, for day after day. Uh, his promise is that he will get you through this, and you will learn something, and he will shape your character, and he will form you to be more like Jesus and more like his son and that you will become a better person because of this time in your life. Um, Psalm 42, if you'll turn there in your Bible, that'd be great. We've got one in the pew in front of you. And uh, we don't know who wrote this uh, psalm. Uh, Sons of Korah may have written it. Maybe David wrote it gave it to the sons of Korah, uh, we, we're not sure. But we find out that the first thing um, this psalmist writes about in this deep darkness that he was in 
in this time of, of great depression, he writes his psalms. And Psalm 42 and 43 really should be one psalm uh, together. They really should be together. And uh, I don't have time to go through both psalms, but we'll see how far we get with Psalm 42. And he writes this. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. And so he's looking out, and let's just say it was David who wrote this. Uh, he was uh, out in the wilderness. Maybe he was running from his son Absalom, and this is, might be the case of this psalm. We don't know. But he's out there, and he looks out, and he sees a deer. And uh, this deer is just panting, moaning for water, and it wants water so badly. And he can't find any water. And David is saying, that's how my soul feels. I long for God. I want God. I want to know him. I want to worship him. I want to hear from him. I need God in my life. And you see what he's saying to us is that the most important thing in these times, and most of us, we, uh, our prayers, Lord, get me out of this situation now, because if you don't get me out, I'm not going to make it. But the prayer should be, oh God, I want to know you. I want you to be my God. I want to worship you. I want to engage with you. I want to connect with you. I want to see you. I want to experience you. Lord, I, my soul's panting for you. Your biggest solution, your biggest uh, problem is, is, it is, it is because you're not having God. If you have God, let's just put it this way, if you have God in your life and you have him speaking with you and communion with you, that's all you need. You just need him. You need God. You need him more than you ever know. Because when you have God, he'll fill up and your whole life and he will make himself uh, known to you and so he seeks God and he says my soul thirsts for God for the living God and he's thinking about his own thirst can you think of a time when you were really thirsty I can many times uh, I've been very thirsty of course I've, we raise sons and sons are always thirsty and uh, they're constantly drinking water and iced tea and other things. But I can remember um, I tried to play football in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, but I wasn't big enough. I, I, I loved the game, but I knew that I would not go very far in it. And I can remember in grade nine, I don't know if they still do, I, don't th I know they don't do this anymore, but a coach wouldn't let us have a water break. You'd be out there running and and this would be August, and this is the state of Ohio. And um, I can remember if you asked to go get water, that was the no-no. I don't know why they withheld water from us today. It's all hydrate, you know, the young people hydrate and water and all this. Well, back in that day, they, you had to wait till after practice to have a drink of water. And, of course, there would be this long line of guys like horses lining up to the trough and wanting to drink that water. And I was so thirsty, I can remember those days. And, and that's what the psalm is saying. That should be our thirst for God, for the living God. Our God is not dead. We don't worship idols. We're not thirsting for a, an idea. We're not thirsting for a concept. We are thirsting for a person, someone you can know. Someone you can have a relationship. Oh God, I thirst for you. And so Psalmist, even though he's going through this horrible time of his life, he's wanting us to know that the most important thing during these times of dryness, during these times when you feel like God has abandoned you, is to thirst for him, is to desire him. He is what you need. He is what you need. You may go search for it here and there. I read an author who said, 
that uh, when he goes through these times of depression, and it's more common than you know uh, among even pastors and Christian leaders. Um, it's uh, sometimes it's just part of what you what you go through. But uh, he said there's three choices: there's drink, despair, or God. And he said, I choose God. And uh, that's uh, what we want to do. We want to choose God. Instead of all these other things that you escape into, uh, from pleasure to sexual morality, to, you know, behind all of that is this thirst, not for that. Your real thirst is for God. That's who you really want and you need in your life. So he says, I thirst for God and uh, the living God, not the dead God, but a living God. When can I go and meet him? Verse 2, when can I go and meet him? When can I have this encounter with him? He wants that so badly. And of course, we know in the New Testament, it's available anytime. We don't have to go to a temple. We don't have to go to a building we can meet God anytime we so desire. And that's the freedom of a, of a believer, is that we can do that even in the midst of the downpour. And look what else he says. My tears have been my food day and night. My tears have been my food. He is not eating. He's not, he has no desire for food. Instead, he's weeping. He's crying. My tears have been my food. You know, there's nothing wrong with tears. Tears are all right. The Bible says weep with those who weep. Jesus, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Was Jesus a man? It's okay, men to shed a tear. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, real men know how to weep. I think of Jeremiah. He's called the weeping prophet. He wept over Israel. He wept over their lostness. He wept over the situation they found themselves in Babylon. He wept over their disobedience. He wept over them. And we need more people who will weep over our situation. Tears are healing. I don't know if I'm just, if it happens a little more with age and you're a little more teary-eyed, but I find myself, I, I mean, I've been in someone telling me their story and I'm weeping, they're weeping, and I'm saying to myself, Tom, get a hold of yourself. This is not helping any, anybody. But I feel things more deeply than I ever have. And it's okay to weep. This psalmist was weeping over his situation. He was so moved. I mean, his whole being is caught up in this. He says, my tears have been my food day and night. And so that's happening internally. He wants God, and for some reason God's not there for him, and he's not able to meet with him. And that can happen to us, where we are desirous of God. And... There's no big sin in our lives. And God is just so distant. And in those situations, it takes our faith and trust in our God to keep going. So that's internally. Then, then they say, while men, verse 3, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? That hurts. That's what persecutor, 
persecution, if it ever comes to our country, that's one of the things they do in the books I've read. In China and all over the world, Christians are being persecuted. They're laying their lives down and they're being tortured. And many times that's the tactic they take. They will say to you, where is your God? You're here in prison. We're able to beat you. We're able to do whatever we want to do. We can kill you. Where is your God? You know, they mocked Jesus like that too. When he hung on the cross, as they passed him by, the mockers will always ask that question. People of faith, we know that it's going to come. But it's hard to take. And uh, in Matthew 27, verse 41 through the end there, 44, it says, in the same way the chief priests, teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. This is the way people mock us. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of the Jews. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. He's trusting in God. Where, are you? Where is God, Jesus? You're on that cross. And that's what people can say to us. Where is your God? What about this? What about that? And there are answers. You've got to go back to the sovereignty of God and study the sovereignty of God and how that interplays with human responsibility and then you've got to throw in the fall and the love of God and how this morning I was reading Romans about the goodness of God and how God wants to bring all circumstances and bless them with his goodness. God is not against us. God is for us. But that's the question you may even ask. Where is God? Where is he? Why has this happened to me? And so these come around, and when people are asking those questions in sincerity, don't go give them some theological answers. Just go weep with them. Just be with them. Where is your God? And then he says... There's a little light here in the midst of this despair that he's in. He says, these things were for, and we're going to look at how we can start to come out of this. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. So he's pouring out his soul to God, and he doesn't understand, and he's alienated, he's isolated, he's in a wilderness. He's far away from Jerusalem, the city he loves. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. So he's remembering back. And as he remembers back, he remembers the faithfulness of God. He remembers the promise of God. He remembers how real God was in his life. And how he used to lead these festivals would be the Passover and Feast of Tabernacles and some other ones, and they would move toward Jerusalem up. You go uphill in Jerusalem, Jerusalem's elevated. So no matter which area you'd be coming from the city, you're going up to Jerusalem. And this procession would be hundreds of thousands of people. And the praise would just break forth in the dancing and the celebration and the joy that was his. And so we want to remember those days. And when you're in this situation, you're experiencing a downpour, you're losing your way, you're not sure which way is out. You want to remember the days when God was so real to you and praise that you gave him and the joy that was yours 
and the life that was in him. Do you have those memories? Here's the problem. Sometimes it's downpour, even your memories become clouded. And the only thing you can remember are all the bad things. And the psalmist is saying, no, you need to remember the blessings of God in your life. Remember, memory is good. So he's saying, I remember those days. I remember the worship services. I remember when I was in the community. He's isolated. And so you remember when you were in the community of faith, the community of God. And he's leading them. And so uh, he moves on to verse 5. And he says this. Why are you downcast? And he says this three times in his Psalms, this refrain. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I'll yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And then he repeats this refrain in verse 11 of 42. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I'll yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And then in 43, he ends his psalms with this, verse 5. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He says this three times. You think this is important? It's really important that you get this. First of all, you need to talk to yourself. I give you permission to talk to yourself. If you haven't done it, it's fun. Your wife will think you're crazy, but your husband... But you need to talk to yourself. D. Martin Lloyd Jones, who was a physician, theologian, writer, pastor, preacher in London, England, physician who became a pastor. And he wrote a book. If you want more information on this subject, you need to read him. He's a classic. His book is classic. It's called Spiritual Depression. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he has this thick book on spiritual depression. He calls it depression, really. And he is quoted in his book by saying this about this verse. He says, you have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must say to your soul, why art thou cast down? What business have you to be disquieted or disturbed? And so you need to get yourself by the collar and say to yourself, Tom, what are you doing? Why are you in such a state? What is going on? What is happening? Why are you disturbed? Why are you disquieted within you? Why aren't you at peace? You need to learn to talk to yourself. Get hold of yourself. If you find yourself drifting out, you need to stop yourself and say, what are you doing? (laughs) You don't want to live like this, do you? I don't want to live like this. Grab yourself like this. Everybody grab, no, I'm just... You need to get yourself by the collar and say, hold it, Tom. Hold it. We don't want to do this. We don't want to go down this path. Because this path is dangerous. It's a dangerous path. You start down this too far, and they get very scary very quickly. And so you want to to talk to yourself. Don't listen to yourself. My wife tells me this. Don't listen to yourself while you're lying down. 
I think that's a good little practical deal. Because you'll never tell yourself the truth. Instead, you want to get up, have a cup of coffee. It doesn't say that in the Bible here, but it may help. Get yourself together in the morning, my friends. If you'll do this every day, you'll be able to get through the downpours. Spend time with God every morning. How could you ever walk out that door as a Christian and not have a blown time with God and get yourself together and talk to yourself? And so what are you supposed to say to yourself? You say to yourself, put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. In the morning, your prayer list is what's happening in your mind. Whatever's happening in your mind, your fears and all that, that's your prayer list. And you want to be able to say to yourself, with all of that, there is hope, there is a God, and he's going to help me. Put your hope in God. The best verse I've ever heard about hope is a famous verse, but I think it's the one that we should all land on and say to ourselves every single day, Jeremiah 29, 11, the context of this, Israel has been led away to Babylon. The people are very sad. They're away from their country, their land, their city, their culture, their people. And Jeremiah writes this first to them. These people are about ready to lose hope. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. What a verse. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. See, many of you think in terms of God's going to punish me. God's going to defeat me. God is after me. God's going to oppose me. But it takes faith to believe that God's going to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. We need that. That's a wonderful verse. Try it this week. Say that verse to yourself every morning. And I think it'll help you get through the downpours of life. So you tell yourself, you grab yourself by the collar and you say, now, Thomas, put your hope in God. Just put your hope in him. Don't worry about everything. You just, that's all your job is to do, is to put your hope in him. And he says, for I will yet praise him. Circle the word yet. That's the key word in that phrase. For I will yet praise him. Yet means there's a future. Yet means it's going to happen. It's not happening now. I'm having a hard time praising God. I'm having a hard time singing. And church seems dry. And this seems dry. And but there's a day coming when we will praise him, yet it's going to come. And then lastly, my Savior and my God. you got to talk to you about Jesus. Jesus is our Savior. He is the one who saves us, who delivers us. The psalmist didn't know anything about Christ. We know everything we need to know about Jesus. He's our Savior. He's our God. He bore our sins on himself. He bore our sorrows and our griefs on him. He took our depression, our despair upon himself. So that we don't have to bear that. So that God can take that from us. He died on the cross. He was buried. And he was raised on the third day. And so our Savior lives. He's not dead. 
Jesus is alive today, and he can minister to us, and he can help us through these rainy days, and he's nearer than you know. He's constantly around us and with us. When our son, firstborn son, went to kindergarten, that's a big day in most families when your firstborn goes to kindergarten. And we lived a few blocks from the, ki the kindergarten where Matt was going to go. This is up in Canada. And uh, there was a busy road and he had to cross. And so we practiced it with him. And um, first day finally comes and we're all excited. Mom gets a three hour break. Of course, she's got two other ones, three other ones. And uh, guess what I did? I followed him. I shouldn't have done this. I, I followed him. He never saw me. But I was always there. Just in case that first day he got into trouble. And that's how your heavenly father is. You don't see him. You don't feel him. But he's there. And he will take care of his children better than I ever did. And he's right here. He's here today. I'd ask us just to bow our heads and maybe you're going through a tough time. I just want you to know that God the Father is right here. Jesus, his Son, is here. His Holy Spirit is here. And we can pray to him. So I'd ask you just to pour out your soul to God. Tell him what's on your mind. Tell him what's in your heart. Say, Lord, I need you. Maybe there are family issues that are just driving you crazy. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's work related. Maybe it's something huge coming at you and you're really afraid. Give this to God. Do not leave this auditorium, this sanctuary until you've done that. Give it to him. Ask him to, to come into your life and to give you strength and to give you power and to give you himself. Father, I thank you that you have plans for us. You have plans for us as individuals. You've got plans for us as a church. And these plans, Lord, are to give us a hope. I pray, Lord, that you would do that. You would give us a hope. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would come and minister to us. I pray that you would meet us. I pray that as we go out from here, we would know that we have been with you and that you are with us. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We want this hope to be for our whole community. And so I want to encourage you to sign up for this uh, Reach 300. Um, I'll give you one item of good news and then... For everyone who comes, I'll give you another item of good news, but you've got to come on Wednesday night. But the donor who gave the 200000 to Samaritan's Purse, who is giving us that money to distribute, gave another, another 100000 
So we have $300,000 entrusted to us by Samaritan's Purse to bless our community. And part of this, we need your help to bring this good news to people. But if you come Wednesday night, I got another surprise, this shocking surprise, amazing. And I'll tell you Wednesday night, if you'll come and sign up, and let's be messengers of hope, let's be messengers of those who need this message in their lives. People are struggling, my friends. For us who never got hit by the flood, life is normal and we just go on. But there are people in our community who really need our prayers. This is not over. And it's hard. And so we want to be in prayer. But you come Wednesday night. Go out back there and sign up. You come Wednesday night, and I will tell you the whole plan. I'll also tell you about some other good news that we have. And uh, anyway, it's going to be a great time. Let's stand together. Thank you for coming. Lord, may the hope of Jesus live in us today. May we get our eyes focused on the eternal, not the temporal. May we get our eyes focused on Christ, heaven, his word, his church those things that will last forever. We bless your name, in Christ's name, amen. amen. Please say hi to someone, especially if they're new and you haven't seen anyone here. Just say hello.